Hi. Uh, wel welcome to my talk on uh, promoting open source methods at a large company. Um, I've got some slides, but I'm not going to inflict the corporate template on you. Um, we'll, we'll post them on the site later, but uh, go without them. So here we are at uh, Fostum. We're all open source developers. Um, we all know about uh, you know, all the great benefits of open source. We've got our differences, but really, we're all in the same boat. Um, you know, we may, we may choose a different license, or we may choose a different uh, operating system, or perhaps a different editor. But uh, really, you know, we're, we're all doing the, doing the same things. We all know how great open source is. So I'm not really here to uh, sell open source to you. Um, I'm doing that inside my company, and it's a bit of an interesting sell. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, but you guys, I don't need to sell it to you. So what I'm, what I'm really going to talk about today is our, our efforts at work to bring our bring modern open source tools and methods into the uh, software environment at the company. Um, and in that context, I'll be talking about our system, uh, Aerosource, um, which is a repository similar to, uh, say, SourceForge, and uh, how, how we've built that up, and a, a fair bit on the technical side of what we've done there, what's worked, what hasn't, um, as we've scaled out. And then talk about our experiences um, in terms of adoption, what sort of resistance we've run into, and uh, what sort of forces uh, have, uh, have affected the uh, evolution of our, uh, of our system. So first, a little background on, on, on the company I work for. I work for the Aerospace Corporation. Uh, we run a, a federally funded research and development center in the US. Uh, we work in the area of national security space. We work for uh, the Air Force, primarily Space and Missile Command, as well as the National Reconnaissance Office, plus any other civil or, civil or commercial organization um, involved in space. Um, we, we literally work in every area that has anything to do with space systems, including things you might not think of, um, such as communication networks, ground systems. Um, we have civil engineers, because we work on things like launch pads. Um, literally every, every engineering discipline, um, plus the things you might think of more commonly, such as launch vehicles, satellites, sensors on satellites, and then post-processing of data from those sensors. So a wide range of things. Um, and we have about 2,500 engineers who, uh, who work in these areas. Um, my, my role at the company is in the Technical Computing Services Department, and we provide technical computing expertise to all of these engineers so they can get their job done. Um, our, we're, on the whole, these engineers are very experienced in, the, in their particular discipline. Um, they have, on, the, on average, over 20 years of experience um, in, in space systems, um, but they're typically not software engineers. Um, and so one of the things we're trying to do is connect them with open source tools and open source methods and really get them up to speed um, and, and start using modern technology in their software development. Um, so as, as, you might, as you might guess, these, these engineers write an awful lot of code. Um, we did a survey uh, back, in, uh, back before uh, Y2K to try and figure out how much software we had, and we determined that we had well over 3,000 packages, um, either external software or internal software that we were running throughout the company. Um, it works out to nearly, you know, to, to somewhat more than one per, in, per employee. Um, so an awful lot of software. Um, so so these, these engineers are writing much of this or modifying much of it for their use. Um, some of it is just private use. They, they do it for the, they write code, they run it, and then they produce, give results to people. Other stuff is shared through, within the company, and then a small amount of it is externally distributed. Um, some of it's purely internal, some of it's modified code. Um, historically, much of this code has been hidden away, um, and this has been a big problem. We've had a fair amount of code that you know, is just sitting on people's desktops um, waiting for disaster to strike and wipe the machine out. Um, in other cases, we might be lucky and it might be on a shared volume, um, but uh, often there's no revision control at all. Probably don't have to sell too many of you on the uh, benefits of revision control, but it's amazingly difficult sometimes to sell it. 
inside. Um, we've, we've had projects um, where we found where they were working on a collaborative team, and you know, they were relatively modern. They, had, they were using a Windows file server somewhere, and they had a whiteboard where when you wanted to work on a file, you wrote the file name on the whiteboard. Um, and even then, they, they were one of our more advanced users at the time. Um, even then, they had problems with functionality disappearing between revisions because someone would add it, they'd build the release and ship it, and then somebody else would take the, the code they'd been working on in that same file and just throw the old version of the file back on with their changes, and poof, there went the feature. Um, so one of the things we're trying to fix here is get this code out in the open. And, and to get it into revision control so that they stop losing stuff. Um, so that, that's sort of one of the many problems we're trying to solve. Um, early on, we recognized this problem. Five or six years ago, we, we, we saw this and said, you know, we should do something about this. Um, at the time, we decided to uh, uh, build a sort of a SourceForge-like site um, using GForge, which was the last based on the last uh, open source release of the SourceForge code. Um, and, you know, we, we, we both wanted to try and solve this problem within the company, but also selfishly, we wanted to have a single server set up so when we had a new project, we could quickly, you know, stand up a new, new CVS repository and new bug tracker and all that sort of stuff. Um, we did get that set up and we attracted a handful of projects from, you know, a couple users and it sort of worked, but it didn't, we really didn't get good traction. Um, we did keep it running, but uh, you know, we ended up with the problem that you'll see if you go to SourceForge, pick, any ra pick a random project, you know, most of them are dead after all, and uh, you'll see the standard ugly default template. And that's what we ended up with on our site. You know, it's the same, the same problem, really. So it didn't, it wasn't a good way for people to find each other's work, um, but it did sort of function. Um, the other problem we found is that it was amazingly difficult to perform an upgrade. Um, it was typically a two or three day full time process, um, which was kind of ridiculous given the, th the system served maybe 10 projects. Um, every time a revision came out, the whole innards had changed and it was pretty awful. So we sort of let it go. It wasn't, we had some success, but it didn't really work out. In 2006, we, we looked at the problem and said, okay, we th we're pretty sure this was a good idea, but we need to try it, you know, let's, let's try again. There's better tools available. At the time, we were, we were really interested in moving to Subversion. We also uh, just had, you know, looked around and said, you know, web apps have gotten a lot better. Um, you know, what the, the experience is better, the interfaces are better, there's much more integrated stuff, um, really a lot better. We also um, thought, you know, we should really try and change the culture a bit within the company. Um, try to get things so it's more sharing, more open, and uh, really just just try and get get people out there and say, okay, let's 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 actually share this code. You know, we only need probably one piece of C code to read two card element sets for uh, satellite ephemerae. Um, you know, probably one is enough. Um, the format, after all, hasn't changed since it was actually distributed on cards. Um, so we, we're tr we try decided to try and work on that. Um, as a result of that decision, we decided that we were going to have, have, have a rule that any project that was in there had to be fully open, just like it is in, say, SourceForge, where everyone, everyone within the company could read the code. Um, that limited the ba our base a bit in that there were a number of projects out there that we knew couldn't use the system because they had NDAs or whatnot where only a restricted set of people could actually use the code. But we, we thought there would be enough stuff out there and we wanted to have, have take that strong stand that only, that people would have to be open. Um, we, we called this concept enterprise source. Um, we actually don't use the term much at the moment, but the idea was that basically open source but within the company. So within the company anyone could could get in there. Um, so it turned out that there was, there was some short funding within, internally to work on a project. We got, I think, three months of funding um, under an innovation grant so we could work on this. And so we, we looked around and we, we ended up selecting a track um, as the basis for the revision control system. 
or, or as the basis for the web interface and subversion as the, as the version control system. Um, what we liked about it is that, the, that it doesn't impose any particular process on the user. There's a very small amount of workflow. You could add more, but you don't have to. Um, and also that it was fully integrated, unlike the classic SourceForge model where they took best of breed tools, such as uh, uh, Bugzilla um, and, and whatnot, and sort of mashed them together. Um, the nice thing was the tools were all really powerful, but they didn't integrate well. So we, we looked at track and we decided that was, we liked the, the integrated model. Nothing was, you know, none of the pieces are as good as the best standalone piece. You know, the wiki is not up to MediaWiki standards or Twiki standards, uh, but, uh, and, the, and the bug tracker is not up to Bugzilla standards, but the fact that the markup works across them and the interface is all the same was, was really useful to us. Um, so a quick segue, before I get more into the implementation details, a quick side. Um, overall, the whole system is built out of open source software. It's a free BSD hosting environment, Apache web server. We started with Mod Python um, as, as our method of running uh, track. It's, of course, Postgres on the back end. And uh, we use the ports collection to uh, create custom meta ports to manage all of the software. So we bring in track and Postgres and all the tools or all, all, all the various tools we need, plus all the plugins, all of those are handled through a custom meta port, which makes it very easy to replicate the system. Um, if we want to stand up a dev server, it's a couple hours work to, you know, build and install everything and then schlep a copy of the data over. Um, so it's really nice. I highly recommend this approach if you're, if you're building any system like this. And I will say, you know, that if your packaging system makes it hard, you really need to fix your packaging system. Um, so on to the implementation details. Um, so one gotcha with, with our selection of track is that it, track is designed for single projects. Um, it has a very tiny amount of multi-project support and it's, it's very, fairly weak. Um, so we had to do a fair bit of work to get that working. In our initial effort, we, we, we targeted simplicity of the configuration. So we used the fact that both track and subversion have the ability to say, um, in the Apache config, here's a directory. All the subdirectories are tr either track environments or subversion uh, repositories, respectively. Um, so we used that because it was simple, and you know the total config was 20 lines, um, and stuck all the all the track environments in one place, all the subversion requirements in a subversion directory, um, and and that was that was very simple. Um, the 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 overall project internally were just. You know, our, we go to the Aerosource host, it just redirects, redirects you immediately to the Aerosource project because we eat our own dog food here and Aerosource is entirely managed within Aerosource. Um, the initial implementation worked pretty well, but it did have some issues. Um, one of the interesting ones we ran into early on, um, it didn't matter too much because to start out, all of our projects were basically the same. But once we started doing custom plugin development, we discovered that, oh, Mod, with Mod Python, every instance of track was living in the same Python interpreter. So if you loaded a module that hooked something like, say, the custom email, like, like, like the, uh, the email notification thing so that you could tweak the uh, results, which we did for one project, if you did it wrong, it changed who you emailed to in every project. Um, and if you think about it, there's the additional problem that since any project can upload a plugin, you then have arbitrary code injection. Uh, is not maybe the best thing. Um, we, we also, another issue was that because we were using, because of the way we were using Subversion, we ended up not supporting um, Subversion over HTTP for uh, commit because there was no, we, we would have had to trust each of our users to manually configure the access controls. And I didn't feel that our users were really up to that task. Um, we provided Subversion over SSH instead, which worked quite well. But uh, it was a little too much for some of our Windows users and did eventually start to hurt adoption. Uh, it was also a minor issue that because we had this one directory over here of track bits and this other direct bit of directory of uh, subversion bits, it was a little tricky to tell how much storage a project was actually using. Um, but enough implementation for the moment. Um, it, was, it, was, it was in fact fun to put all that together, get it working, but you know, the real proof is uh, in adoption rate. Um, 
I've got the one slide here that is probably worth looking at, but I'm not going to show it. Um, the, uh, there's a, it's a, gra a graph of project growth overall. So for the, about the first year and a half of, of uh, Aerosource, we grew pretty consistently at about three and a half projects a month. Um, and then about a year ago, we started to get more pickup um, due to a number of internal factors. Um, and, and we're now, the last six months, we've actually been growing at an average about 10 projects a month. So I've been pretty happy about that. When I put these slides together, we were about 204 projects internally. And then I think since then, we had a little lull in December as no one was really doing any work, um, or at least not starting big new projects. And uh, now we're up over uh, 210. So, and in addition to just the numbers, we have had some actually, some, some really nice wins, I think. Um, one of our biggest wins um, was that about, after about six months in, we got um, management pressure, started to apply to people and say, you guys need to get your code into the repository and start working in, in this environment. And one of the big ones was a program called the Satellite uh, Orbital Analysis Program, or SOAP for uh, maximum acronym confusion. Um, <laughs> Especially when a couple years ago we started writing web services modules for it. Uh, the, uh, so we got that in. That was a big one. That's one of our few external software products that we actually give out to uh, uh, places like NASA and uh, some of the uh, military sites. Uh, it's a very pretty graphical program for plotting satellites and, and whatnot. And getting that in we thought was a really big win. We've definitely got some holdouts. But that was, that was a big one. And actually, one of, the, one of the annoying holdouts is a major library that SOAP uses. But I think we'll get there eventually. So we have had some, a number of things that have, have delayed adoption in, in a number of cases. In some cases, we've had, a legitimate, issue, we've had legitimate needs for a more secure system, um, one where not everyone within the company um, can see the code. Uh, everyone inside has a clearance, but not every, but it's not appropriate in all cases uh, to make the code available. So we've had some legitimate issues, but most of our issues have come down to a real lack of a sharing culture, and we've really been trying to change that with, I think, some success. Um, in many cases, there's, there's an odd perceived need for security. People are convinced they need to hide this stuff from their fellow employees, um, despite the fact that they should be able to generally trust them. Um, so that was why, that was one of the reasons why early on we said, look, it's all got to be open. We won't provide any alternative. If you want to be in here, you've got to keep it open because that let, gave us a wedge. And we said, we could say, look, you want these features. We know you want them. So you need to really look and see, do you actually need to keep this stuff secret? And in many cases, people didn't. But it's hard to get people to convince people that that's really the case. Um, we've also had interesting issues of, there's a real fear of misuse, that if people put their code out, that their fellow engineers will go off and use it in some inappropriate way. Um, sometimes that's legitimate. Um, you know, something that's not written for human space flight shouldn't be used for human space flight, obviously. But for the most part, we've, we've been able to convince people that, you know, you, know you, you really do need, you really can trust your, employee, your, your fellow employees to, to, to do it right. Um, but that's, that's been an interesting challenge and something we're still working on is that, that we really need this more, more openness. Um, there's also some interesting cases of a misplaced sense of ownership. People are like, this is my code and you know, I'm not going to let anyone else use it. But in fact, you know, it's the company's code. It's not your code. Um, so it's really, it's really interesting to get that sort of thing. Um, trying to encourage people to give credit is, is a real challenge. It's something the open source community does very well. And we're trying to work on, on ways to get people to do that. We've had some, some limited success in that area, but it's, it's a little tricky. Um, the strangest ob objection, though, we've had so far to Aerosource was if we put it in there, people are going to see it and they're going to like it, and then they're going to write new code. Um, we actually had a long argument one day with, with a group. And they were like, no, it would be horrible. People would come and they would write code and, and make it better. <laughs> um, and, and I will admit, we lost that one. Um, <laughs> we were like, uh, isn't this a great problem to have? You know, yeah, yes, you'll have to spend some time doing review, but wouldn't it be awesome if you had to hire another person so you could do review? 
um, of, of new code. Um, but that, that one still floors me. Um, fortunately, it's not all gloom and doom. Um, we've had internal pressures as well that have really helped us out in terms of getting new projects. One big thrust that's helped is a, a big push over the last decade for continuity of technical operations. That's similar to uh, you know, continuity business operations where you know, you're set up, you have a second SAP instance somewhere so you can print your paychecks if your data center gets flooded or whatnot. Uh, continuity of technical operations, or CODO as we typically call it inside, um, is basically the same thing, but you know, how do we get engineers back up and running? For instance, we have, um, we have tasks that are um, go, no go for uh, rocket launches. Um, we have people analyzing weather data to make sure that the upper atmosphere is, is right. Um, so it's really important that we be able to, uh, if we have, say, a fire or a flood or an earthquake, we are, after all, based in LA, um, that uh, we be able to get back up and running. And with all that hidden code I talked about, that's really hard. Um, you know, if, if the only copy of some critical code is on some guy's laptop, um, you know, even if it's in backups, you still have to dig the backups out. If we lost the data center, you know, we'd have to have, have to retrieve them from Iron Mountain and then figure out where they were, um, that sort of thing. So getting code into a repository and getting it, getting it properly handled and backed up um, is gonna help there. Um, so we've been, so, so there has been, been a push and, and Aerosource has been named the Kodo repository for internally developed software. And so that, that's been, been really helpful. It's really increased the number of projects going in. And, and one of the things we're seeing is that once we get somebody in for that reason, they'll see the tools, they'll like them, they'll say, wow, I don't have to maintain this pesky server anymore. Um, and uh, then they start putting in more projects. So every time we win a new group, we get one convert in a new group, that it'll start to snowball. So that's really good. Um, so one, one thing we did have to do when we became the Kodo repository is um, we, we had to relax our everything has to be open um, setup because there were in fact projects that are of critical importance that did have NDAs associated with them, either because you know, they incorporated data from a particular contractor or we're, us we're using uh, somewhat sensitive uh, uh, sensor material or sensor uh, information or whatnot. Uh, so we did actually create a separate project sort of within Aerosource called Aranda, stands for Aerospace Restricted and NDA. And, NDA. Um, and the idea is it's just like Aerosource except that it's access controlled. Um, project requests are used the same form, you just check a box that says I need this. And then because we didn't want people going, oh, I'm gonna go get an Aranda project because you know, I don't want other people to see my code because maybe it's awful or maybe, you know, or you know, maybe I want my job security or whatnot. Um, so because we didn't want people to do that, we require that people submit a justification with a traceable security requirement and then it's approved by my, by, uh, my boss who reviews, reviews all those things. Um, now I'll talk a little bit about the implementation changes we had to make to make this, to make Aranda work. First off, we needed to harden the system. So we used the uh, Center for Internet Security benchmarks for both uh, operating system and for Apache to uh, tighten down the security config. We were pretty good already, but you know, a few tweaks here and there didn't hurt. Um, we also switched to per project um, WSGI, which is uh, Web Server Gateway Interface um, instances. So this got us away from the Python instance per project, um, and, or, or rather, a single Python instance, so we did have a Python instance per project. Um, we also moved to having group-based access restrictions so that we could have, so that these Aranda projects could only be accessible by certain groups of people. And because we did that and had to do all this splitting out, as a side, of, side benefit, we got uh, HTTPS um, subversion commits working. Uh, we've also, for the Aranda project, switched to uh, per project virtual hosts for the primary name. Um, not really using that for anything at the moment, but the idea is that later on, we could move to a model where we had per, per, potentially per project uh, jails, or even, or even we could cluster the project so we could have multiple servers um, and use smaller servers to scale. Uh, in the process, we also consolidated the storage structure so that we had one single point of file system entry for every project. And therefore, 
um, we could more easily manage the security and verify it. This implementation has also worked reasonably well, but it has some new issues. Because we now have a Python instance per project running inside an Apache instance, it runs running inside a, an Apache process, um, <coughs> the server rapidly ran out of memory. We originally had two gigs of RAM in it. We ran, put it up to four, but we're still, get it, it's still a bit tight. Um, fortunately, um, we've got a new server on order, so that will to, uh, to fix the problem the brute force way and go from four gigs to 72. Um, that should keep us for a little while. Um, we've also, as, as a workaround, we set the processes up to die after five minutes. So, if, so given that most projects aren't being hit all the time, that helped keep memory footprint down. Um, one problem we've discovered, though, is that the internal web crawlers for our search engines have the world's worst access pattern for us in that they'll go into each project and read exactly the same subpage all the way across at several per second. Um, and so the server on the weekends gets kind of sluggish. Uh, fortunately, the upgrade, I think, should fix this. Um, one other issue is that the subversion access, well, we went to per process or uh, per project uh, uh, WSGI instances, and in that, and for Aranda projects, those have a a different user for each project. Um, we can't do that with Subversion because uh, the Subversion uh, Dave module um, runs as only can only run as the web server. Um, it'd be nice if that could be fixed. We may actually, once we get Kerberos integration into our uh, into the system, we, I think we'll we'll switch to uh, 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 switch back to doing to promoting SSH based. Uh, subversion access to, to address this issue, especially in the more secure projects. Um, we also had the problem that, again, with the subversion module, it leaks memory like crazy um, under, under SSL. Um, can't check out a large project without running out of memory. Basically, have to keep retrying. Um, overall, adoption's been not what I would have wished. When I put these slides together, we only had 10 projects. Um, we'd, we'd announced in August and that was in November. So I think we're up to maybe 15 now. So we seem to be growing, but it's slower than I'd anticipated. We knew there was some pent up demand and I'm a little surprised that we haven't had, had more pickup there. Um, I suspect in part that the reason we've had this is that the users who have these security requirements tend to be in their isolated little worlds um, and maybe just don't, ha haven't really seen the value of, of the open source tools yet. Um, I think one other problem may be that they're also expecting that we're offering them revision control and they're thinking, oh, it's going to be one of these massive heavyweight systems where you have to fill out six forms in order to make a change and whatnot, um, you know, like, like you would for flight safety software. But really, we're not doing that. Um, I think others may just not know we exist. Um, so we're, we're in the process of an ad campaign for that. Um, but it's a, it's, it's a, I haven't quite got the pickup I would have liked there talk a little bit about future directions here now. That's, that's sort of the current state of affairs. So we're up at a bit over 200 projects. Um, not bad, it's about one for every 10 engineers, so um, pretty decent. Um, so in process, in, in the, at the moment we're working on getting new servers and also moving to a, moving to a system where we'll be uh, using FreeBSD and AID and ZFS um, to allow us to replicate projects. We're going to have a new server on, our, on the East Coast, so we'll replicate data regularly to actually provide the kind of backup we should be, um, in addition to merely being on tape. Um, we're also looking at some track enhancements. One of, the, one of the things we've found, for instance, is that users will get, get, get one project, they'll get it going, they'll be happy, and then they'll get excited and they'll create four more projects because they have all these different projects they're working on. And that's great. And then they say, oh, but I wanted to see all my tickets at once. Um, and right now, there's no mechanism for that. So we're working on uh, creating a mechanism to do that. Hopefully, we'll be able to write something that we can contribute back in a useful way um, and get back into the community. Um, we're also contemplating some ideas of sort of a cloud or clustered approach where each project can live on a different server, um, looking at that. Another one we'll, we'll almost certainly be doing is 
adding more revision control options. Um, I think for many of our users, centralized revision control is probably what they can get their heads around at this point. Um, but I think we're definitely seeing a lot of advantages to distributed version control. So we're going to probably start bringing that in. We've got some sort of unofficial mercurial support at the moment. Um, but it gets a little more complicated. We need some new, some new track features uh, or some up and coming track features um, to make that really work. We also, because of this, this need um, for Kodo, where we, need to, where we need to have a reliable central repository for backup purposes, we're going to have to carefully manage how people use distributed version control so that it doesn't all just end up back on their laptop. Um, and that's something I'm really interested to see how, how that works out in, in the, how, the, how that's working in the open source world and what lessons we can apply in that regard. And overall, what we're really continuing to work on is trying to convert more users to, this op to, the, to the whole open source frame of mind, um, really get them more into it, get them more open, get them to share with each other, because I think that's really powerful, one of the best things about open source. And I think if we can make that happen inside, that, can, that will really improve our ability to, to deliver. So in conclusion, I think uh, uh, Aerosource and, and the, uh, the Aranda component are introducing people to new tools and methods. Um, we're, we're seeing some real, we're, we are seeing some real traction there, but we've got a ways to go. Overall, I think it's positive influence. Um, I've got a few minutes left, so I'd be happy to take any questions people have, and uh, either, he, either now or later. And uh, I'd like to, uh, also, if people have ideas for how to promote open source in an environment like mine, or want to talk about that sort of thing, I'd love to do that during the conference. Um, be around. Also, I want to plug Richard's talk. Um, he's com coming up next, and I've seen, seen a version of it before, and it's great fun. Any questions? Hello. Hi, um, I'm Robert Wigetman from Eurocontrol here in Brussels. So it's the European equivalent of the FAA, let's say. Yeah. And uh, there was one remark that you made which uh, surprised me when you said that uh, for the SOAP, the so-called SOAP project, that management pressure was positive. How, why did management suddenly realize that this was a good idea? How did you convince them? Because this is the, for me, the clueless management is usually what blocks everything. Um, we, we actually got management, the, the management pressure came from the fact that so they were in a, at the time I was in the, uh, the computers and software division, and they were, I was in a research arm, we were a bunch of, you know, crazy open source people. The other, the other guys had been working on this thing for 10 years, and they were in fact one of the projects that had a history of feature loss. So the customer would pay them to add a feature and then it would disappear and things like that. And, and we were spending a couple man years every year on this thing, so it's a significant asset. Um, so, Management said, "Look, you guys, you know, we've got this great op this great aerosource thing. You guys should use it, and and so that's that's where that's where the manage the positive management pressure came from." Um, is any of your uh, software likely to be of interest for external consumption as well? Uh, is that even a discussion you might? Some, sorry, so you, sorry. Your software is—is um, is any of it going to be of value outside your organization? Is that even a discussion you're willing to start? Um, well, I guess we're, we're trying. We're trying as as we develop larger modules that that make sense. I think we're going to try to push those back. Um, most of the software that's in Aerosource is is stuff that we couldn't ever release. Um, our release process is not is kind of a pain. Um, we do a certain amount of, of open source, but um, right now, I think we've got one, I think we've got a couple projects within Aerosource that are also released as open source. For instance, we have a, an LLVM. Uh, we, some, some people in, in my old department wrote the uh, cell backend for LLVM, and that, that lives in Aerosource. So, so that. Hello, um, Daniel Barrage. I'm working for a company called Market, which is um, we we our company's gone through um, s something similar to yours. We've got um, a lot of different companies that have sort of been, uh, come in, and we we've got a lot of different.
types of technology. I just wanted to ask you about um, adoption. You said adoption was something you struggled with a bit. H how have you tried to educate the people in the organization about what you're doing? <clears throat> so I guess, h how do we educate people? Um, it's, it's kind of, I mean, a lot of it's word of mouth. Um, just, you know, we get one person hooked and they talk to other people. Um, the, other, the other thing is we have some internal uh, like tech forums and whatnot where people are supposed to come and talk about new, new IT technology within the company or whatnot. And so we're using that, we're using those forums to broadcast. Um, one of the things we're working on is to develop some curriculum for our internal um, education program, um, both to teach the particular tools as well as doing general overviews. Um, we, need, we need to build more of that stuff up um, or adapt existing stuff. For instance, you know, we need a subversion course. Um, you know, and, and there's good stuff out there, but we need a short to the point version and then maybe advanced for later use, but that sort of thing. Okay. Thank you very much for coming.